feedback you should talk to us about rank. Justin, I'm nearing the end of my PhD at Northeastern University, uh, where I've been working with my advisor, Owen Shivers, and co-advisor, Pete Manolios, on the design of an array-oriented programming language called Remora. It's a higher-order language, which is not a particularly out-there kind of idea, but rank polymorphism is the rule that functions automatically work on arbitrarily high-dimensional data. So if we have, say, f applied to data like this, means we can also have it applied to larger dimensional arrays like these. And this works because each array sort of contributes implicitly its own control structure based on the shape of the array itself. And Remora started out as a project to try to infer that implicit control flow at compile time. But I'm not really here to talk about how we go about that. The, the story behind this talk actually started from a visit to Google last year, where we were giving them the explanation of how Remora works. And then one of them asked, could you make something like Panda's data frames as a library in Remora? And this is kind of an interesting question, because Remora is really about homogeneous data, whereas a data frame is this sort of heterogeneous columnar data table. Um, but you can do this if you sort of pick apart the data frame into using two different notions of aggregate data. So the first is arrays, and these are homogeneous data, which means you consume the elements uniformly. This is what rank polymorphism is for. And records are uh, sort of foundational type of heterogeneous data. And you consume record elements individually by projecting out whichever individual fields you actually care about. So I was able to build in very little time a simple data frame system within the prototype of Remora that we already had. Since it's embedded as a domain-specific language within Racket, which is a scheme-derived language, I just gave Remora access to Racket's own record data, and now I have data frames, which are basically isomorphic to an array containing records. But isomorphism isn't really good enough outside the ivory tower. Um, this turned out to be really unpleasant to use this system. Just weird aspects of Racket's struct system, which looks sane on its own, turned out to make data frame computation a bit of a pain. So I asked, OK, how should I design record data types to actually be good for integrating with rank polymorphism so that I can have nice, easy data frames without special library support? And the, the key part of the answer turns out to be you need a small collection of mutually composable constructs in order to make everything work nicely. So for the benefit of those not familiar with APL, I'll go over rank polymorphism and how it works specifically in the context of Remora, the language I'm designing. And then also, uh, what is a data frame? and What does Pandas offer in terms of functionality? And then I'll explain the design I came up with for record types in Remora after looking at several other systems' ideas of how records work. And that included Racket, Python, Standard ML, a few others. But I don't really have time to give a full tour of all of those. So you can sort of interpret this table of contents as what I have, what I want, and how I'm going to get it. So starting from rank polymorphism itself, the data model in a rank polymorphic language is sort of a two-level thing where you have atoms and arrays. Atoms are your very basic data type, whether it's numbers, characters, booleans, and arrays
these are aggregate structures made of some atoms. So you might have this 3 by 2 matrix, or you could have a vector of booleans, and we'll even say a scalar is just a zero-dimensional array. The shape is an array's sizes in each dimension, just given as a sequence of numbers. The rank is the number of dimensions an array has, hence the phrase rank polymorphism. Why is a scalar not a one dimensional array? The one why is that a zero not one? As opposed to being a unit length vector. Yeah. Right. Uh, sorry, the, sorry the, the, right. The, I mean it's a valid question. The the sort of lifting rules can be written more simply if you have the idea of a zero dimensional array as the base case versus saying a one dimensional vector which can grow to be anything. And as a general rule in this language, expressions only really stand for arrays. You can't get your hands on a bare atom on its own. When you decompose an array as part of function application, you break it up into what are called the cells. These are the individual subarrays that the function is going to consume. And the frame is whatever aggregate structure exists around these cells. Now, there are generally a lot of ways you could do that. Uh, if you have an n-dimensional array, there are n plus 1 possible decompositions. So for this matrix, we can say, here's a 3 by 4 matrix frame containing 12 scalar cells. And we're sort of imagining each of the atoms in the array being packaged up on its own as a scalar. We could also say that it's a three-vector frame containing four-vector cells, or a scalar frame containing a single three-by-four matrix cell. Now, the abstract values I've shown you all look like this, whether it's the matrix or the three-tensor or the scalar. But we need programmatic notation. So Ramora syntax uses sort of nested brackets to distinguish how many dimensions you're wrapping around something. So we can say the matrix is the vector of vectors, or the three tensor is the vector of matrices. And then the sort of null case of nested bracket syntax is just use no brackets when you want a scalar. Now at function application time, you remember we have to break this into cells. So the cells here, when we're applying plus, are 10 and 20 in our first argument, and then 1, 2, 3, and 4 in the second. The frame, that's the aggregate structure around them, is a two-vector for the first argument and a two-by-two two matrix for the second. Which means the expanded forms of the arguments that we're semantically going to be operating on are made by replicating each cell as many times as is necessary to add whatever additional dimensions we need over here. So that means the 10 grows up to a vector containing 10s, and the 20 to a vector containing 20s. But the 1, 2, 3, and 4 didn't have to grow at all. By contrast, we might, oh, I'm sorry. That should have been a vector plus. Um, if we say here that we're doing a vector addition, then we have a single vector cell in the first argument and two vector cells in the second. So we have a scalar frame and a two-vector frame. We'll grow the vector cell into the matrix, each of whose rows is that first vector. But then since it's a higher order language, we also allow any expression you want in function position. So actually the plus itself you know, stands for a scalar array, which we then have to grow out to a matrix in order to make the semantics work through properly or vector plus will grow into a vector of vector plus functions. So our final results are 11, 12, 23, 24, or 11, 22, 13, 24. And this all comes out of whether we're treating the cells as vectors or saying the cells are scalars. So the expected argument rank in a function application is really determined by the function you're applying. And that says how you're going to split the arguments into frames of cells. So plus says give me two zero-dimensional arguments. Vector dot product says give me two one-dimensional arguments. Matrix inverse will say give me a single two-dimensional argument. We 
could have linear interpolation on three scalars. We can also mix and match the argument ranks if we want. So a polynomial evaluation function can take a vector of coefficients, but then a single scalar x value. And since the expected argument rank is important, we have to include it in the definition of a function. So when we write out the definition of linear interpolation, we say, here are these three argument names, here are their respective ranks. This also means we can change the argument rank the function expects by eta expanding it. So the vector plus from the previous slide, we could write as We'll make a function on a rank 1 argument called A and a rank 1 argument called B, but then apply the scalar addition function to those two arguments. And this is a common enough thing in array programming that it's worth more concise notation. So in the Remora prototype, we've been using this syntax where you say tilde and then a paren list of the argument ranks you want to have and then whatever you want in function position in the function body. There's one more thing we need to deal with in the model, which is ragged data. Uh, this comes up when you have a function whose output shape depends on not just the input shape, but also the atoms in those arrays. So Iota builds up you know, some counting out array of a particular shape, or if we read something from user input, we have no static knowledge about what we're going to get. Filter could drop an unknown number of things from whatever array we give it, and reshape lets us dynamically choose a new shape for an array. So if we say iota with the shape as being the vector 3, so we want a 3 vector result, we get this. But if we lift iota and say, give me a 3 vector and a 2 vector and a 4 vector, uh, we get something like this, which doesn't really fit in our data model. There is no matrix like this. We can't give it an actual shape. So data like this is not directly allowed. Instead, we add another type of atom, which is a boxed array. And this is just one single atom, which happens to contain an entire array as its enclosed value. So we can build our ragged result vector as a vector of boxes, each of which contains a vector of whatever varying length. And this means we'll have lift-safe versions of those functions that produce boxed results. So when we say, you know, a star of three different shape vectors, we can get three boxed arrays packed together in the vector frame. So that's what we have. Now what are we trying to build in this setting? A uh, data frame is basically a columnar database. You can still think of it as combining, well, lists and records here. So here's Python's idea of record type. It's a dictionary mapping strings like location and day and month and year to particular values. So this is a weather reading from Dallas on the 28th of March. The high was 74, the low was 57. We can build a list of dictionaries if we want, but Pandas offers a more sophisticated tool. That's the purpose of the library. And we can build that data frame structure either using our list of records, or we could use a record containing lists. So a data frame is something you ought to be able to build up row-wise or column. You should also be able to extract particular columns from the table if you want. So in Panda's case, a data frame is a dictionary of series objects, which means we can use Python's regular index operator, ask for the loc field of the dictionary, and we will get a series saying, what are the locations we just looked at? We could also ask for a list of columns and get a new data frame that contains only the columns we asked for. So if we ask for location and high temperature, here's what we have, just locations and high temperatures. We also want to be able to update a column in a table by applying some transformation function. So you might have noticed that in the data we had, um, 
it's a uh, gnome, we have a high of 31, whereas in Tunis we have a high of 26. Something has gone wrong in our data collection here. The problem is not all of these are in the same temperature scale. So in order to do a bit of cleaning, we'll say if the location field of some row is in the US, then do a Fahrenheit to Celsius conversion on its low and high fields, and then return the new version of the row. Then we can apply this normalizing function, but we have to specify we want it to apply to each row in the table. So now we have everything in the same temperature scale. We can also filter out particular rows of a table if we decide that we're manually exploring some data set we've collected and we only really want to focus on a particular part. Say, I just want the temperature readings from Dublin. We start by building up a series object of Booleans saying, here are the ones corresponding to readings from Dublin. And then when we use the index operator with that series, we'll get only the rows corresponding to the true elements in the series. This looks great until you try to do it for your own specified selector function. We had that in USA bit, we want to know if some location in the column is in the USA, but this does not really lift. Instead, we get an error message. So it's, we're really stuck writing our own by hand loop construct. In Python, the preferred method is a list comprehension. Then we get our list of booleans, which we can use for indexing into the table. We also might want to generalize from filtering to partitioning, but we can't just give it multiple boolean masks. Instead, there's another special purpose-specific method called group by. And then that will get us a particular structure from which we can ask get group true or get group false. So we have a wide range of functionality available on data frames and we have nice and easy support for row-wise and column-wise operations, but it's a lot of ad hoc structures and methods, a lot of very purpose-specific things, and the rules for how scalar things lift to work on aggregates don't really generalize nicely, especially to user-defined pieces of code. Uh, so another array programming fan has already weighed, on, weighed in on this sort of thing long before Pandas was released. It's better to have 100 functions operate on one data structure than 10 different ones on 10 different data structures. So the synthesis design that I came up with after investigating several different record systems, so the priorities here are we need creation, projection, and update to be anonymous functions. That was one of the big hitches I ran into using Racket Struct system where every collection of columns you're using requires defining a struct type. And it's that struct type definition that gets you the creation function and projection <coughs> function. It does not get you any update functions. You still have to write those yourself. And since Remora is meant to be a statically typed language, we would like a design that fits more easily with static typing than the Python style mapping from strings to data whose type depends on which string you asked about. So starting with the constructor function, if we want functions we can construct that depend only on the set of fields we have, let's just invent new notation since we're doing some language design ourselves. Say the record keyword followed by the list of field names means whatever record constructor for a record with those field names. We can still support something like record literal syntax by saying this brace enclosed list of field and value pairs just desugars to the record constructor applied to all of those values. And we also need functions for projection and update. We can get those with lenses, which are uh, a well-known function programming trick in certain circles. Uh, a 
lens is a function that sort of zooms in on a piece of a data structure. And we'll say you can make a lens for a record field by just saying lens and the name of the field. Uh, since lenses themselves are functions, you can compose them using just the normal function composition operator to zoom in deeper and deeper in some nested data structure. So a thing I didn't show you in pandas was that you can actually have hierarchically nested columns. Something like a database of airline flights might include a source airport with a latitude and longitude and a destination airport with its own latitude and longitude. We also have three operations for consuming lenses themselves called view, set, and over. The way view works is you give it a lens, and view of the lens applied to some record just gives you the f that particular field within the record. We also have set. You apply it to first a value and then the record. And it will give you something like the record, but with <coughs> this particular field changed to this value. And then over is similar to set, except instead of giving a value here that will replace the old one, you'll give a function that will apply to the old value to compute the new value. And it's worth having syntactic sugar for this sort of thing, since we don't want to keep writing out all of this. So we'll say hash underscore and some field names is view on the composition of lensing those field names hash equal for set, or hash hat for over. So record creation, remember, we can do something like record literals, say the location is Dallas, day is 28th, and so on. We can view the year of our Dallas temperature reading, it's 2019. Since we have a higher order array array language, we can view the high and view the low packed together in a vector frame function application lifts to give us the vector of results. We also have two different ways we could create a table. We can go row-wise by listing out each record individually, but we can also say column-wise, make a what looks syntactically like a record literal containing vectors, but remember this desugars into applying the record constructor to several vectors, which means it lifts over those vectors. So what we get is, again, a vector of records. Column extraction works by just applying the view functions the same as we would do to a single record. If we say view location in temp readings, we'll get the vector of locations. We can also build a new table out of a subset of the columns by saying the location is view location of the old ones, the day is view the day of the old ones, and so on. So now we have a table where we've only kept the high temperatures. We don't really care about the low temperatures. We can also update more easily than we could in Racket's own structs, but it's fairly similar to working with Python. The select in Array languages is sort of an eager if. Uh, this exists because certain parallel hardware does not handle control divergence very well. So the usual solution is just compute both and then pick one. So if, the, if we view the location of some weather report and it's in the USA, then our fixing function is just the our, Sorry, and it's not in the USA, this is backwards. Then we should be fixing it with Fahrenheit to Celsius. Otherwise, fix it, fix it, with the identity function. And then we'll apply fix temp by using over the high field and over the low field. So that applies the function to those two fields. So if we normalize temperatures in our temperature readings, we have the corrected version. We can also do row filtering. The way the filter function works in array languages is not using a predicate like you might be used to in a list processing language, but you give it a Boolean mask, much like we did in the Python indexing trick. So we'll compose the in USA check with view the location, and when we apply that to our high only table, we 
get the ones from the USA. But importantly, <clears throat> when we apply filter with that to our high only, we'll get only the ones we actually asked for. And now we can generalize from filtering to partition. If we say filter, I want just the orange ones, we get that. We can also say, filter, I want the orange ones, and I want the blue ones, and I want the purple ones. But we've hit the ragged data problem again. So you remember, something like this isn't really a valid array. We have to use the lift-safe versions if we're going to be partitioning it. But we didn't have to invent a new data structure just to hold these. Box data has been around for a long time. So our row partition, we can say we'll use the in the USA and not in the USA, and we'll get the ones in the US and the ones not in the US. So how do we want to design records to work with rank polymorphism? Again, you're looking for a small collection of mutually composable constructs. Thank you. Any questions? Zero length vector. 